Uh, welcome everybody to today's IST lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce Gunnar Karlsson, who took out some time from his busy schedule to visit us. Um, as you can guess from his name, he is Swedish, um, but he left for the US uh, at an early age and then he went through a string of uh, recognizable names, uh, schools in, in the US, uh, studying at Harvard and then Stanford, then working in Chicago, in San Diego, in Princeton, and then back to Stanford. I think I didn't forget anything. Uh, I know him since, I don't know, 2000 or 2001. In 2001, there was this um, movement of making topology computational or somehow developing this field, and then in, he had the foresight to organize a meeting. This was the first meeting of the group and to somehow define or uh, work on topological questions, and this became the ATMCS series. This is now a, a international conference series every two years. We had the last one here at ISD Austria. Some of you might have been here. Um, then we overlapped in a DARPA grant on topological data analysis from 2005 to 2010. And then from this effort uh, came a company, Ayasti, that Gunnar uh, founded. Um, I looked on the web, but I couldn't quite figure out what year it was founded. 2008. 2008. Okay, now we know it. And uh, according to the website, it works on financial data, on health care, and on the public sector. And then the, I find terms like fraud detection and money laundering, or uh, ra preventing money laundering, I, th <laughs> <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, anyway, um, Gona is a good example of a pure mathematician. So he worked for decades on algebraic topology, algebraic questions, deep questions. Um, that he's known for, but he also has a, a neck for applications and, and somehow in the 2000s it really exploded and he developed and he, he founded his company, he spends time there and he's really very active in making mathematics useful outside of mathematics. Uh, please, we look forward to your talk. So thank you, Herbert. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I've certainly had a great day today talking with many stimulating people here in the audience and uh, in this beautiful place. So thanks very much for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> what I want to talk about today is uh, something that's in the news a lot. You'll read it in magazines or on the web uh, about artificial intelligence. Uh, it's uh, obviously, let me see. Uh, you know, lots of different points of view on it. Some people say, well, it's about learning to play Go. Uh, other people would say, well, you know, it's about building, uh, you know, answering systems for call centers. Um, and many things in between. Uh, you know, as, as Herbert mentioned, it might be about situations like money laundering where, you know, banks spend a tremendous amount of energy and people's time and so on doing investigations uh, where 99% of those investigations turn out to be nothing at all. And so if we can you know, cut down on that labor a bit, that's another aspect of artificial intelligence that one might want to, to, uh, to consider. So yeah, it's an area of huge importance. It is or will be in, in finance, in healthcare, uh, medicine, uh, gaming, and whatnot. Uh, it's hard to think of a sector that's not going to have some, where it's not going to be uh, applied. Often th thought of, and for people of my generation, because the word is not new now, it wasn't even new 20 years ago, we heard about it you know, a long time ago, um, but it was thought of as doing the following, as taking tasks that humans have already solved, that humans already have a solution to it, but the solution to execute it is, is very onerous, is very you know, tiresome, maybe you can't really do it uh, effectively, or at a minimum it's very boring and you would like to replace it, someone uh, uh, by a machine in that case. Okay. 
But what's happening now is we want to get to situations where there is no human template for the solution. Okay, in other words, where uh, we're dealing with problems like in genomics, for example, where you have very complicated uh, data sets that sort of describe the way that, uh, that cells behave, that their ge uh, genetics de determine their function. Um, those are problems that humans really can't solve. On, you know, we, we could look at spreadsheets you know, of, of these numerical values all day long, and we still wouldn't even get through and read the whole spreadsheet. So what that means is we need to solve the problems without a human template. And what that means is that if you want to do artificial intelligence, you need to be able to solve data problems as well. You need to be able to solve the data problems that surround the task that you're hoping to accomplish. You're hoping to accomplish to understand and to, to act on the behavior of the genomic information to cure disease or do other things, then that's what you need to do. Um, so it means you need to understand and model uh, complex and large data. So that's a fundamental need here. Now, the thing that's only become clear to me recently is that in addition to that, in addition to the data that we actually get from the, uh, from the problem domain, Many of the algorithms that are being designed, and I'm thinking specifically of deep learning here, which is what we'll talk about, but it's true in other situations as well, the algorithms are so complex that we don't understand how they work. And so if we want to understand how they work, and usually we do, uh, then uh, we have to study a data analytic problem, not on the domain thing, but actually on how the machine is operating. And we'll show you an example of that in this. Okay. So <clears throat> now, the, the kind of thing that what we want to do is I say we want to model complex and large data. Now when I think of, I think when most people think of mathematical modeling, they think of algebraic modeling. They think of you know, situations like Galileo faced, uh, like Kepler faced, like Newton faced, where you're studying um, physical problems with a relatively small number of variables where there's a relatively simple theory that actually reflects quite accurately the interaction of those variables. Um, and so in any event, one thinks of it in, in algebraic terms as the mathematical modeling being um, you know, algebra or perhaps differential equations. Okay. But let's step back for a minute. Many of these algebraic models although they work well in these physical situations and you know, some others, they also tend not to work well when the problem is really complicated, when it's really complex, when it's messy, all those things, when you can't get your head around it just very naturally. You can make guesses potentially about it, but you need to develop ways of doing modeling that allows you to formulate hypotheses. And so, let, so let's ask, can we talk about a more generalized methodology for modeling? And the question then is, what do models buy you? What do we want? Well, we want some compression. If you think about linear regression, for example, uh, that's replacing a data set which might have tens of thousands of points in it by two numbers, the slope and the y-intercept. Okay? So if we believe we've got a good approximation by a line, then, uh, then we get a compression. We get understanding. Uh, you know, as Newton and Kepler and Galileo demonstrated, when you actually start to understand, or when you actually start to have a model like these, they give you uh, understanding. And of course, I realize it goes both ways. The understanding perhaps builds you the model as well. But when you have it, it, it it's, it's extremely useful. It can lead to prediction. It can lead you to allow, allow you to predict a y variable based on an x variable. Uh, in other words, when I've done the data analysis on a collection of points and I now have a new point coming in, well, I believe that it's going to fit along the model, and so I can perform my prediction that way. But now the question is, do models always have to be algebraic? Should, is that really, uh, is, there, is there a reason that it has to be? And I would argue that, well, first of all, we know that it's not really true. We can think of clustering as a modeling mechanism. The output here is not a system of equations, but is rather a partition of the data set into different groups, distinct, conceptually distinct groups. Um, so uh, this certainly provides understanding. In fact, it, it can be thought of as generating a taxonomy of the data. Uh, it also compresses it because, uh, you know, if we have uh, three clusters and 10,000 points that are divided into the three clusters, that's a, that's a huge compression as well. 
Now, what statisticians found was that uh, the methods that they had, so by the way, the theory of clustering is what I would call the Wild West. Uh, it is, you know, there's many, many different algorithms around and people use them in many different ways and they develop, you know, um, heuristics for how they should choose the parameters in it and so on, but this, the real story is there's just too much going on there and it's too hard to choose the thresholds. The statisticians developed a very nice methodology that allowed them to at least remove one of those parameters, one of the, one, some scale parameter from their description of the clustering algorithm because they actually had a more sophisticated mathematical object than just a partition, namely they had a dendrogram instead, which described a whole family of partitions getting coarser and coarser as you increase the parameter. And so that sort of suggests maybe we should uh, be attempting, we should recognize that we could take different kinds of mathematical objects and regard them as models as well. Okay. So what are the problems with algebraic modeling? I would argue there are a few, often, they're too, often too rigid to deal with the complex data. Uh, really, if you have equations that are of degree 100 or so, that usually doesn't lead you to insight. Uh, it doesn't work well for situations where you have just straight discrete outputs and again requires very high degree approximation in many cases and often requires an initial hypothesis about how one variable behaves with respect to the other. On the other hand, what are the problems with clustering? Uh, as I say, too many algorithms, the Wild West problem, um, often requires choices of thresholds. The output is really too discrete sometimes. You, sometimes you may want a, a pure partition, but sometimes you want to know more about your data than that. You want to also capture continuous phenomena, which might, you know, continuous phenomena are what algebraic methods typically model. Uh, and it turns out that even the hierarchical methods, that is to say, uh, the dendrograms, um, have, these, have this issue. They get these breakpoints and uh, it becomes too discrete. So a question for me is what's another organizing principle for complex data? I want to take sort of the full uh, complexity of the data and see what, uh, what should we do. So here's a statement. Uh, we want to say that the data has shape. And what I mean by that is the data has typically comes equipped with one or more natural ways of uh, deciding which two points are similar and quantifying the similarity or actually the dissimilarity. And on the mathematical side, what that means is the notion of distance on the data set. So it fits neatly into the mathematical formalism of metric spaces, of finite metric spaces. Okay, and so that, that kind of thing gives you the shape of the data. So now what do I mean by the shape of the data? And in fact, what do I mean by the thing that I just said? I claim everybody in the room already knows this on some level because you've seen data that looks like this. Um, now, data like this, we would all look at it and we would say, this looks like it fits along a line. And indeed, we would see that we would approximate it by a line in this way. Um, and as we've already pointed out, if you can do this, it's extremely powerful. It is what you want to do. Um, you know, if it really approximates the data well, that is great. That's what you want. Okay? On, the, on the other hand, it turns out that the data doesn't always agree to lie on a line. For example, you might have data that looks like this, okay? And now, let's think, so by the way, the, the, the linear regression is approximating the data by a shape, namely a straight line, a very simple shape. Now, I have this other kind of data, and, and again, we talked about clustering before. In this case, it also uh, looks like it's approximated by a shape, except the shape is a little different. It's not a straight line, in this case, it's three discrete points. You might not even think of three discrete points as a shape, but it is. It is a, you know, is a set uh, you know, in the plane or in, in, in higher dimensions. Okay. So clustering, just like linear regression was approximating by a line, so uh, clustering is approximating by discrete sets. Okay. And now we might hope that we're done, that we, these two things cover it all, until we reach a data set that looks like this. Um, and now, there's a different shape here. It's not a straight line. It's not a discrete set of points. Um, this kind of data comes up, or this kind of shape comes up, often if you're considering periodic or recurrent phenomena um, in time series. Uh, you see it's got a loopy shape to it. And now we might say, well, we, we decided to build approximation algorithms in the first two cases. Shall we do the same now? 
And, you know, a mathematician would sort of jump, yeah, yeah, let me add it, let me do it, let me go ahead and build a loop detector or a loop approximator. Um, but, you know, maybe the mathematician's older colleagues might think, uh, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to put in a lot of work to build a loop detector, but what makes us think we're done now? In other words, what, uh, why do we believe that when we're finished with this, we're going to be done? And indeed, we'll come up with a data set that looks like this, which has a different shape. Uh, you know, it's now a, kind of a letter Y. This might come up, for example, if I'm uh, collecting data from an airplane that's flying with, at no, uh, with a normal mode being flying at altitude in uh, non-turbulent conditions, and three abnormal modes, which would be takeoff, landing, and flying in turbulent conditions. So this now is approximated by a Y, uh, letter Y, and we might say, well, I could build a detector for that as well, and I could, but I don't want to, because I, I believe I'm sort of on an errand that has no end to it. So the goal then is to say instead, let's try to build a modeling mechanism, whatever math we have to put into it, whatever that object has to look like, that can capture all these shapes at once in a single package. Now, I'm going to show you here a, uh, what do we call a, a hokey example. <laughs> that is to say, it's not quite, a, it's, an, it's an imperfect analogy for what I'm going to do, but nevertheless, I think it conveys some of it. So, um, <clears throat> so the Königsberg Bridge problem was a, a recreational math problem that was posed to Leonard Euler uh, in, the, uh, in the 1700s. Okay, and the question was, can you cross all seven bridges across the River Pregel in Königsberg and cross each bridge exactly once? Okay. And when you look at this problem, you know, there's all kinds of stuff in here. You know, there's, the, there's the depth of the river, there's the size of the island, there's the length of the bridges, on and on. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of detail that doesn't matter for the question of the problem at hand. The thing that matters is the simplified version on the left there, which is a network or a graph um, where I've got four nodes, two of the nodes correspond to the river banks, two of the nodes correspond to islands, and then each bridge has an edge to it. This very simplified structure is then something which is simple to reason about, and Euler did that and found out that the answer was, well, no, you can't, as we would all be able to do as well if we looked at this, at this network modeling situation. Okay. okay, so what I want to show you now is a way to do this systematically for uh, data sets, to accomplish the same kind of task for data sets. Okay. So first thing is we're going to apply projection, and here I don't mean necessarily projection on a coordinate, although that's what I'm showing you here, but uh, a function of you know, maybe, maybe even a pair of functions or three functions, real valued on the data set, and those functions are often things that are statistically meaningful, like measures or estimates of density or measures of centrality. Uh, but they might also be things coming out of machine learning, such as a principal component one or a principal component two. They might be functions like that as well. Okay? And the way I use those projections, uh, the projections though, is um, I, I use them to bin the data. So because I have a projection to the, uh, to the interval here, and let's see. Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to uh, cover the uh, line by overlapping intervals. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. And uh, I'm going to take the pre-images of those intervals, and I'm going to connect, find the connected components, try to cluster those. And so with that, oops, sorry. So here's the picture. I had overlapping intervals in my target space for this projection, and I use it to build four bins for the data. Um, and uh, so now I have the bins, and you'll notice that the bins overlap, right? Uh, the, because the intervals overlap, you can see I've got some orange points in the second one from the top and some orange points in the, uh, in the first one from the top, and those orange points are the, are, correspond to the same thing. Okay, but, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a network like this. I'm going to build the nodes of the network by taking a clustering scheme, but I don't apply it ever to the whole data set. I apply it to each of the bins individually. So I'll call them kind of partial clusters. And I'll assign a node to each partial cluster. Okay. So here now, you see, because see, in, in those middle two bins, we've got two clusters in each of them. And so I will assign two nodes to each of them. 
But now because the, now, so, so you might say, well, big deal, you know, you performed clustering, but not only that, you know, you, you messed it up because they are not, it's not even a partition. You know, it's a group set of group, uh, you know, it's, it's a collection of groups. The nice thing about that, and that, you know, that's called a soft clustering, is that it leaves me some information about the clusters because the clusters that overlap should be maybe considered somehow closer or similar or more related to each other. And so what I'll do is I'll build edges between each pair of nodes that overlap. And you'll notice that here I've reconstructed the circle. I've lost some detail for sure. I've lost information about the curvature and so on. But I may not have cared about the curvature. Okay? Um, and so. Anyway, this, uh, this, is, this very simple construction is a basis for a way of modeling data that I'm going to show you some examples of and we're then going to use to look at deep learning. But, okay, so topological modeling, what is it? The, the output is a graph or a network. It can be laid out on the screen for viewing and for interacting with it. So I can actually interact with such a thing in the same way that I would with Photoshop or Illustrator. That is to say, I can select groups. I can save them back to the database as you know, full primary objects. Um, I can build new models on them. I can find the, the characterizing variables for them, um, uh, and so forth. Another thing that I can do, which will be uh, quite interesting, is to do hotspot analysis. That is to say, if I have a function that I'm interested in of the, uh, of the data set, I can, each node is a collection of data points. I can take the average value over that node of those, uh, of those uh, values and get a number, and therefore color the graph by that. By that. Uh, the, the explain phenomena, as I said, one can find the explanatory variables and also do uh, feature selection. So I want to show you some examples now. So um, our, our company actually has a good number of academic collaborators. This particular group is from Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. Uh, they studied a data set of about 11,000 people diagno diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. I often read articles about these things, and you, know, you will often see things that say, oh, diabetes is connected to cancer. Diabetes is connected to neurological symptoms. Diabetes is related to this, to that. And those are interesting observations, but they're not actionable, not immediately actionable. What this model shows that these folks created is that actually type 2 diabetes is actually three diseases, and I should say the, the answer now is four. They kind of found a split in one of these more recently. Um, and one of these groups is heavily correlated with cancer, and the others are not particularly correlated at all. So if I now understand that type 2 diabetes is four diseases, three or four diseases, and one of them is correlated with cancer, that means I can start to attempt to address them with different uh, you know, tr treatment protocols, different, different ways of dealing with them. So you know, that's a step in the direction of precision medicine. Now, what I would say is here's a different step in the direction of uh, precision medicine, which is, uh, this is a fellow named uh, David Schneider. Uh, he's a microbiologist at Stanford. And he studies the progression of infectious disease in humans and in mice. Okay. And the measurements are physiological variables, but they are also genomic variables. And he's trying to tease out you know, what, what affects what and, and, and how does all this work. And so he wants to build a profile or a model that describes what phase you're in in the process. Now, you might say, actually, can't we just keep track of time? Can't we say one day in, two day in, and so forth? Well, for two reasons you can't do that. The one is um, that actually that time, the amount of time spent as part of the process varies a great deal, even from different parts of the, of the process. But secondly, we also don't typically have access to the point, the infection time. Okay? So we want to understand an intrinsic way of understanding the state that you're in as part of this process. And so if you think about what such a model would look like, it should look like this. You should start out here at the healthy state. And now I follow a trajectory as I'm getting sicker and sicker and sicker, and then the immune system kicks in, and I follow an arc, and hopefully I get back to the healthy state. Notice, though, that my trajectory back to the healthy state was not at all the same trajectory. It's not just following in reverse the trajectory that I had in, coming, in getting sick, because my immune system is firing on all cylinders. Everything is pushing hard, which was not happening before. 
And so it really is this loopy model. And so what he's managed to do then is to understand how to characterize the states here. Each of these models gives a way of understanding what, the, what point in the process that you're in. Uh, it's helped him a lot in developing understanding of what's, of, of, of what's going on. Um, <clears throat> so here's a, a, another one. Um, this is microarray analysis of breast cancer. Uh, this comes from the so-called NKI, National Cancer Institute of Holland data set. Uh, it's 272 patients, 1,500 uh, gene expression values. So uh, there are technologies that produce um, <clears throat> uh, you know, numbers attached to every gene in every sample. It says well, this gene is being expressed at this level in this, uh, in this situation. And so here what you find is um, if you look on the far left, these are sort of healthy, normal-like patients. There are a few in, in samples in there. And then, as I move out, there's a split that happens. Uh, there's an upper one which is labeled basal-like, and which is <clears throat> where, where there's very poor prognosis, unfortunately. Um, uh, and then, going down to the right, you have another group, and where we found that as you get past that area that's labeled sparse data, I hope you can see that, that group actually had perfect survival through the length of the study. No clinical information was used to build that. This comes purely out of the gene expression information. Okay? So it's discovered a group that's a very good survival. Now we're going to come back to this example in a second. But uh, um, so let me. So I want to talk about another way of using this kind of modeling. I've just shown you how to, if I have a data matrix where I think of the rows as my samples and the columns as the features that I'm measuring, I could also take that matrix and turn it on its side uh, and take its transpose and build a model not of the patients but of the columns, of the features. And that's actually an important thing to do because if we think about that cancer data set that had 1,500 genes, that's 1,500 features, there's no way I can go through and do sort of uh, I certainly won't want to, uh, you know, do the various two by two correlations, and probably I don't think I'm going to get what I want out of that anyway. And so we can take the transpose matrix and build the topological model of the features instead. So we've imposing a geometry on the feature space. And what we can do then is we can say each data point is now a function on the set of columns because each data point gives a number for every column. And so when I have one of these nodes, which is now, remember, a group of features, I can take the average value of that and get a functional value. So in other words, each patient will give me a coloring, their own profile, on this map of the feature space. And I can do that for groups of patients as well. Okay? So now let me just remind you again that I'm going to talk about three separate cohorts here. I have the cohort A is the perfect survival, cohort B is the poor survival, uh, cohort C is the near normal. Okay. And so here now is a picture. So you'll notice that this graphical model here is identical. It's colored differently because it's colored by, different, by the average value over the different cohorts. But the, the graph is still the same. So you'll notice there cohort A uh, is heavy blue at the bottom. It is also bright red at the top on that, in that main island. Okay. If I go to cohort B, um, you know, which was, is the poor survival group, then you look at that and you see actually that the, what was blue in the other has flipped to red, and what was red in the other has flipped to blue. Except, actually, there are a few anchor uh, features there that are actually stay red in the middle of that, well, that blue region. And in fact, you'll see they also stay red in the middle of cohort C. So that's a collection of genes that somehow you know, can never stop expressing. Okay? But now, l l the point, a normal way of addressing this would be to say, I'm going to list all the variables by their correlation, by, in order them by their correlation with survival. Okay? And then I start to look at that list. I take the 1500 order list, much like looking at a very long Google search, the output of a long Google search. Okay. Furthermore, the, the only thing is that the entries in this Google search are not understandable things like you know, products on Amazon, but they're instead these long cryptic sequences of uh, you know, letters and numbers that, dis, that, 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 that label a gene. What this tells you is a priori, yes, you know, you're going to find some interesting stuff in there, but really there's two phenomena going on. There's one group of genes. The, the one at the bottom of that main island, 
that you know switches from red to blue, and similarly one the top one that switches from uh, blue to, oh, sorry other way uh, blue to red and, and red to blue as I go from cohort A to cohort B. What I can also notice is that I can look at cohort C and see that it really is much more of a weak form of cohort B than it looks like cohort A. It has the, the same properties as cohort B, it's just a little weaker at it. Okay? So in any event, my point is that from the point of view of kind of exploratory data analysis where you're trying to, to get your hands around what's going on, uh, this kind of thing can give you quick information uh, rapidly. Okay, and it allows you to act to, to deal directly with a data set with thousands of variables. You can actually deal with it, you know, quite directly like this. And just a similar example here is the the, the study of the gut biome. Uh, so this is uh, Larry Smar at UC San Diego um, has studied that. The features here are bacterial populations. Uh, there are about ten thousand different bacterial populations. The abundance of which is being measured. In the, you know, in the samples from the gut. And so what you can see here is in your lower left is the healthy profile, healthy coloring. On the lower right uh, is uh, uh, ulcerative colitis. Uh, and you can see that they actually look quite similar with the exception that there is a bright red area in the ulcerative colitis on the right there, which is circled by a black uh, loop, which is not present in the healthy. So again, there's one thing going on in the ulcerative colitis, and it's a bunch of populations acting in concert. Similarly, in the upper right, uh, it's Crohn's disease. Uh, and you can see there that what's, what's missing in Crohn's disease is that uh, there's a, a circled group in the healthy people on the lower left, small red group, that is simply not present in that Crohn's disease. So again, gives you kind of a very rough and ready way of getting at information in the data. Um, finally, let me talk about model diagnosis and improvement. This is um, <clears throat> a situation where we're studying the data set consists of questionnaires uh, from, from the, I should say, the, the uh, personnel in an intensive care unit concerning patients. So they fill out questionnaires about them. And co collaborators of ours had used genetic algorithms methodology to um, predict, build a predictor for who's going to live and who's going to die. So in the upper picture there, it's colored by that predictor. And you can see it's pretty simple to understand what's going on. The bottom is colored by uh, ground truth. And so you can see that on the right there, there's, the predictor is doing something good. That's for sure. There's a group of red there that's also red in the predictor. But what you can also see is that in the, and it's hard to see here, I, I, I agree. Uh, but in the upper left, there's something that's red in the ground truth. Uh, and green in the, uh, in the predictor. You know, dramatic, so that's a dramatic misprediction. And so we probably want to know what that is. So we can select that group and analyze it, and very quickly we come out and we find that it turns out that in that group, several questions were failed to be um, answered, and they related to the energy and the mood of the patient. So you know, now, of course, you can say, I'm going to build new models uh, for just for those people, or I'm just going to be aware that my models don't predict well. OK. Um, and finally, a uh, final example here is a genomic data set. Again, gene sequences. This is from three separate populations. These are uh, Han Chinese, uh, Caucasians from Utah in the United States, and the Igbo uh, tribesmen from, the, uh, from Nigeria. Okay. Now, any method that calls itself a method for data analysis can, def can separate these groups. If you don't, you need to go home and you know, work some more. Um, but notice what the model shows you. It's not something you necessarily were looking for. But what you'll notice is that that red one over there, which is the Han Chinese, is more carpet-like. Its texture is different. Uh, the other two are more stellated uh, and have higher degree. And uh, so. Now, you might think that that has something to do with the biology. Is the biology really different between these populations? Maybe that one might think that. But what you find out as you look into things, you come up with a more reasonable explanation, which is that, um, in fact, uh, there was a pro data processing step that took place over in China that did not take place in the other two. 
And the step that took place was removing parent-child pairs. So they, they said, look, if you have a parent and a child in there, I don't want them both in the data set. If I have a family maybe of, you know, of nine or something, I don't want to put them all in there because they'll somehow dominate. I mean, that would be the argument for doing that. And so they chose not to do that, whereas in the others, they did not take that pre-processing step. We like to always think we're doing the science, but in reality, there's a lot on this whole, the, the, the whole issue of how you handle the data, and it comes up all the time, and one can never afford to be unaware of it. Okay, so anyway, simplification here, that one should build uh, models of the data space and the feature space, so ideally you should build topological models for both. You should have the ability to select groups in both, and the ability to color one by groups in the other. And this gives uh, what I would call explain capability because it allows you to understand how a group of rows, a group of samples, might look as being colored in the feature space. Okay. okay. So now I talked about, uh, I mentioned deep learning early on. So the rest of the talk now is going to be around uh, an example that deals with uh, thinking about deep learning specifically in the context of uh, convolutional neural nets, as they're called. So, uh, the methodology is based on neural networks. I'll tell you what those are in, in briefly, but it's produced absolutely outstanding classification results for many complex data sets. Data sets of images, data sets of gene sequences, data sets of text, and also somebody using actually certain other topological methods has sort of fed those topological methods to get them to, do, to get uh, the, the, the neural nets to do um, classification involved in drugs discovery. There are some problems, though. So here's something that if you have a data set of images, then there's a standard one called MNIST. And if you just mess the slightest little bit with the background in a way that we almost would be unaware of, but certainly would not, would, would not deter us from predicting that something is a one or something is a two. So we look at it and it looks, yes, it's clear as day that this is a one or a two. If I do that kind of thing and put it to the deep learner, the deep learner will freak out and it will, it will, it will completely uh, you know, lose its ability to predict. Okay. Um, there's a general lack of transparency. So you know, it, it, it looks like a black box. It is a black box. No one can argue that it isn't a black box. And when you go talking to, if you're building methods for performing prediction in financial context and you have to deal with regulators, or if you're dealing in healthcare and you have to deal with regulators, uh, or frankly in, in many other domains, this idea that one is going to take the results of a black box and trust it and believe it, uh, you know, for going forward, we, well, we're not there. Uh, it, it, when I go around and talk many times to people in these domains, and when you talk about the general lack of transparency and the black box nature, the whole room nods. Um, so, anyway, this limits the usefulness in many key domains. And we also like to, to be able to learn more complex models. We might, oftentimes what it's asked to do is to classify something. It might be asked to estimate a distribution on a set. But um, we'd really like it to potentially learn even some of the topological models I'm talking about. Okay, so what is a neural network? Well, um, there's an object called a perceptron, which, and, and what that does is that it, it takes some Boolean inputs, x1, x2, through x5, so the 0, 1 input. It has some weights on it, and it will sum those weights up, and then there'll be something called an activation function that decides whether it activates to 0 or 1, depending on the value of that sum. So it's a pretty simple thing. It's got an input of you know, a, a little vector of zeros and ones, and it puts out zeros and ones, and it does so in this prescribed fashion. Now, it's still a perceptron depending on how I choose that activation function. I can choose it in many different ways. But what one typically does is one makes such a choice at a certain point, and then when, for one's whole calculation, and then one builds a, you know, an, an array of these things. So an array of these perceptrons that are computing the one from the other. So here you can see that node in this, you know, one of the nodes in the blue thing in hidden layer one um, is connected with got three entries going in. And so it will compute uh, that as we talked about there. Um, so, so that it performs those computations. Question is how do you get the weights 
And you get the weights because you are actually, those are variables, it turns out, and you are able to optimize those using uh, vari variants of uh, gradient descent. So um, again, the activation at a node, a node or a neuron is computed using this uniform activation function on the set of nodes. So it's trained by optimizing algorithms. And the final output then is some kind of a formula we wouldn't recognize it, we can't write it down in algebra terms, but it is a formula, namely all these weights, if I give you all these weights and the network structure, I give you a way of computing uh, the output. And so, what I sh so and, and that's the technology that works as, as, as beautifully as I described. Now, there's a specific uh, choice uh, of, uh, well, I should say, for, kind of a slightly different methodology called convolutional neural networks. It's still a neural network, but, um, this, but the structure of the network is adapted to images, really, let's say. I mean, it could be adapted to text or time series. But the picture is kind of like this. It's got um, each layer is itself put into one-to-one -one correspondence with an array of pixels. Perhaps some pixels abstracted, so maybe I, instead of you know, 28 by 28, I will go down to 14 by 14 or, or, or 7 by 7. And then I compute there. But, but an important point is that I insist that the connections, I don't allow it to be fully connected, as we saw in, this, in the previous one. You'll notice, oops, sorry. Here, every node in layer one is connected, in hidden layer one, is connected to every input layer. In the convolutional situation, I don't permit that. I only permit a neuron to be connected to neurons that are close to it, that sit in the box right around it. So it enforces a locality, if you like, on the, um, on the situation. Not only that, though, what I insist is I want to have it be the case that if I see a cat in the lower left-hand corner or a cat in the upper right-hand corner, I'd like to detect it in the same way. And so what I insist is that every feature, every, you know, that, that, that the weights um, are the same no matter where I am in the image. Now, let me say, you might say, well, that looks like, you know, you've set it to be one feature. The answer is that here, uh, notice that I start out with one rectangular array on the far left. Now I have a bunch of arrays in the next layer. And so the thing that's required is that within each of those individual layers, no matter where I move in the, you know, in the, in the, in the uh, array, the weights are going to be the same. So that's the convolutional thing, and that's the thing that has, that's, I would call that property, the homogeneity property. Um, and typically there's sort of other stuff that goes in also. They have a notion of coarsening features called pooling. Okay? So I believe that the topological data analysis has the ability to deal with four separate aspects of this new feature generation, study of analysis of data sets of weights, analysis of data sets of activations, and also creation of topological models. What I want to show you is a study of the weights. Okay, uh, that's the thing I'm going to show you today. Now, and it's motivated by the following. So, <clears throat> when we first started this project, this uh, this topological data project, um, we studied a data set of three by three image patches, uh, with the idea uh, that it was constructed by David Mumford and uh, collaborators. Uh, and uh, they were high variance three by three patches, so we did not include uh, the, 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 you know, the constant ones or essentially constant ones, low variance ones. Um, <clears throat> and what we also did was we recognized that, and this is generically true for data sets here, is that you almost always want to choose the densest part when you do topological analysis because otherwise small outliers can have damaged the topology uh, quite severely. So uh, in any case, one has to threshold by density. So we take the most frequently occurring patterns among the high variance guys. Um, and so again, this, this whole analysis and the data set, the collection that went on was motivated by the goal of understanding how the tunings of neurons in the primary visual cortex affect, are affected by the statistics of the images. So if you, you believe that if you have a patch that occurs a lot, you would want to um, encode that with a single bit if you want to try to compress a signal. And that is, you know, one could view that as what's happening in the primary visual cortex, as we'll see. So anyway, the, the initial analysis was, uh, you know, the primary circle like this. So these are the most frequently occurring patches. 
Um, uh, as you can see, this is not so surprising. This is actually kind of the, that linear approximations are best. You can see these are discretized versions of you know, white to black gradients, but going at different angles, and that angular variable is the circle that encoded it. Um, but what we found was that when we did our analysis in a slightly better way, we, we built a better density function, we saw that actually it wasn't just those things. It was also two secondary circles, which you can see are the red and the green below. Um, and uh, they actually fit together in the primary circle. So you see the two greens on the secondary uh, fit very nicely with the two greens on the primary and so on. So this, uh, we found, was a good analysis. And then we said to ourselves, well, we, you know, do we really believe this is all? Do we believe that suppose we relax the threshold sum uh, and got a two-dimensional object instead of a one-dimensional object, what might that be? And so we found out that it's a gadget called the Klein bottle. Um, and this shows how uh, one has, uh, how they're laid out on the Klein bottle. So the Klein bottle, by the way, if you've ever made a Merbius band, it's what happens if you now also try to attach a point on the boundary of the Merbius band to its opposite. You'll tear the paper if you do that, because that surface won't fit in three-dimensional space. But as a surface, it exists. And it dem demonstrably exists because it's identified here. So you'll notice that if I take, say, that where the red, hits the red line hits the black line, and now I go to the counterpart, but with a twist, I have the same gadget. So this is like take a, take a Merbius band and then connect the other edges around. And, and that creates this surface. The reason it's nice to have a model like this is it allows you to build you know, algebraic models. Uh, it has Fourier analysis, and you can study texture with it and so on. But OK. So now, and, and, and what's the primary visual cortex? The primary visual cortex is the lowest level processing unit beyond the retina. Um, they have higher level gadgets, V2, V4, and so on, that perform more abstract tasks. And that's kind of understood that that happened. Lots of neurological, uh, neuroscience studies have been done to look at that. Um, <clears throat> and what Hubel and Wiesel showed was that individual neurons in this V1 uh, are actually are able to detect both the edges and also lines that occur in the uh, um, in the images, so the lines that, that we saw that occurred in those secondary circles. So again, there's this uh, high order picture that you know, you're going from lower abstraction to higher abstraction. Okay. So and my question is, can we understand what's going on in, in the CNNs? Um, does it behave like human learning? Does it come up with the same results as human learning? Is it, is it working in the same way? So, Question is, what might we want to know? So can we, can we first of all see similarities, or can we see some relevance of what we've just seen in the image patch data? What happens as the network learns? Can we trace it? Can we see how it, what, what it's doing as it's learning? Uh, what are the responsibilities of the various layers as I build layers? I may build shorter, you know, not, not so deep models. I might build much deeper models with more layers. And here are the data sets that, that, that we used. But let me just show you, because this one kind of gives a good indication. So this is done on the very simplest, the dead easiest um, data set, uh, MNIST. It consists of a lot of hand-drawn digits. Okay. And so what we did here is we did the exact analogous thing that we did in, the, um, in analyzing the weights uh, in the image patch situation. That is to say, we took each node in layer two and asked, what are the weights coming into that node? Now, those nodes are only, there's a little nine vector of those, nine, nine things surrounding it, a box, three by three box with that one in the center. And so there are nine weights. So each neuron in there has a um, nine vector attached to it. Okay. And that's the, and, and I should say, perhaps even each you know, choice of rectangular array within the layer has such a choice because I'm talking about these convolutional neural nets. But the short story is that I'm actually able to generate a data set of, no of vectors with nine entries just like we had three by three image patches. But I get them here out of the neural net. 
And, and now, we did all the same things. We have to, you have to uh, again, if you don't threshold by density, you will get nothing. It will all be garbage. Uh, but if you do it by uh, density, uh, then you can see that the topological model for these things looks like very much like that loop. Okay, now you might say, well, do you really believe that it's a loop? Uh, you know, I mean, that we, maybe we have the model, but you know, maybe you fiddle that model. And so it turns out there's a methodology also around um, that, that can allow you to verify the models, or at least give stronger indications. So it's called persistent homology, and it produces a so-called barcode signature. So in this case, you can see that, um, in this case, there's a very long bar in dimension one, which is code for there's actually a strong circular loopy behavior in this, in this data. So that, I have not emphasized that persistent homology methodology in this talk, but it's quite interesting. And what it allows you to do is to have some way of getting some you know, reasonable notions of the fact that your, your models are representing something, uh, something real. Now, in a more complicated data set, so this is CIFAR 10, this is different kinds of objects, and also it's got color to it, although in this case it was reduced to grayscale. What we found was that, um, that uh, you know, we got some interesting things. We, we got this, these, the primary circle sitting there, but also a kind of bullseye in the middle, um, which is a different pattern. And again, it, you know, there's <coughs> barcodes for those. Now, I had posed the question, what happens as the, as the neural network learns? Okay. Um, so, and I, I think this is quite interesting to look at, actually. This is CIFAR 10 again. Um, <clears throat> now, in this case, some of the models, you know, the, the, the actual graph is actually like a carpet, but you can color it by number of points in a node. And so you can see here that as I move from what's essentially random stuff in the first layer, I get to something which looks more circle-like if I take the red stuff, and even more pronounced in the third step over. And then in the fourth step, something interesting is starting to happen. It's starting to remove itself from that circle and start to be concentrated around four points. And as it does that, it's even doing more, and it's finding something in the center, which is more like that uh, um, bullseye that I showed you. OK, so that's sort of strange. You would think we felt that that primary circle is the dominant thing going on. So why is it go getting there and then allowing itself to degrade? Well, it turns out, if you look at the, what's happening at the second layer, which is the next layer down, you can see that it's essentially doing nothing. It's not doing anything while the, uh, while the first layer is arranging itself. But then, as it gets itself arranged in like that sixth one over, you can see that it starts to produce the primary circle. So, in other words, the primary circle has sort of taken over. It's, it's allowed the first layer, what's happening in the first layer, which says, you know, I need to recognize some of these other features other than just the primary ones. Maybe you, second layer, need to take over and capture what's capture the edges. Here's one. This is another, uh, another CIFAR situation. And here we actually got the quite clear as a bell, the three circle model. Uh, as you can see here, it's got, those, it's got those same lines. And it shows a barcode signature with five long lines there, which is characteristic of that three circle model. And now finally, a, uh, a, a pre-trained <coughs> uh, network. Uh, where we could study this same situation. This is so-called VGG16. Uh, this is to get even a better sense. Like before, I've seen only two layers. This has 16 layers, actually, or, or well, let's see, 13 layers. Sorry, the, the final three are not uh, convolutional in this sense. And so we've got models for each of them. And you can see that what's happening here is very much like what we expect to have happen in the human situation, uh, where the first two are kind of really the primary circle. Those are the edges there. Then you start to get some secondary circle in, 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 in layer three, and then other things start to happen. So you can see there, five, there's a kind of a cross that's happened. There's a bullseye and a cross in layer seven, seven and so on. So you, you know, I wouldn't take any of these layers as God-given. You know, but what it does indicate in, in general terms is that what you're seeing is that you're generating, you're keeping, actually, in this case, the primary circle is being kept around always in all these layers. 
But then, um, uh, you, you know, at the higher ones, it's including additional things that it needs to have in order to recognize more complex images. So by the way, this one is trained on a very large data set of images called ImageNet. And so, you know, it needs to do more than a neural net needs to do to classify the digits in MNIST, for example. Okay. So one of the things one could do then is you'd say, well, let's hard code the primary circle and, uh, and the Klein bottle. Let's hard code features along those lines. And it turns out that, that what that does is it allows you to speed up the training, first of all, and also to improve generalization. So um, the speed up uh, was a factor of two for MNIST, but actually of 3.5 for uh, house numbers SVHN data set. But what it also did, though, was um, remember in the beginning I talked about this failure to generalize. That is to say, if I take MNIST and I build a model for MNIST and then apply it to house numbers, SVHN, I get 10% accuracy. So in other words, I've gotten no use out of that training on MNIST. But if I train with the, hard, with the features hard-coded, you get to 22%. So obviously not where you want to be. Uh, we've improved that a bit, I think, to we were at 33. But there are issues with this SVHN that still say that there, there's a lot more that needs to be done. However, that the fact that, that hard coding these features can improve the generalization, which is a big, big problem for the neural nets to be able to generalize from one data set to another, that's uh, you know, uh, an important thing to, to do. Um, so very quickly then, I want to talk about quickly how one can uh, build architectures, build the actual computation graphs based on the TDA models. Um, so one of the th things, so, the, the, so the, the convolutional neural nets, they have a grid structure for their features. Each feature is a pixel. And so, of course, they have a geometry on there. It's a grid geometry. It's given to us a priori. But suppose that we then discovered, as we did in that study of the image patches, that there's geometry, there's some additional features which also have a geometry, like a circle then can I build networks that are not just rectangular arrays, but maybe something like a rectangular array crossed with a circle? The answer is yes, you can. Uh, and um, you, what that allows you to do is to have um, you know, very useful uh, situations where you incorporate the geometry of the feature space that we talked about before into the building of the, of the network. So, um, but there are three different situations, actually. So, one is where you have uh, an a priori geometry, like the grid. One is where you've got a discovered geometry that you've done by doing some science. A third one would be saying, I don't want to do any science, and I don't have any a priori geometry, but maybe I can build a mapper, uh, that is to say this algorithm, the topological model of the feature space, and use that somehow to build an architecture. So I need a formalism, and I'm not going to take you through that. I'm just going to show you. Um, that, for example, if I have a circular geometry, then I can build layers that are circular like this and where the connections are made local in the circular geometry. And in the same way, I can talk about um, what I would call mapper. The algorithm that I discussed in the first half of the talk is called mapper. Uh, and here we have two Y-shaped mapper things. And the connections, again, would look like this. So anyway, the short part of the story is that one can actually use this information to build these geometries. We're just at the beginning of this, so we have not explored everything that that does for you. Uh, but you know, we've found that it can certainly shrink the number of connections from something which, where you would a priori have a fully connected thing to something with less than 1% of the same number of connections, so reducing the computational cost. And one of the things that I've found out in sort of talking to people who are working in this area is that, in fact, one of the big problems with, with many applications of deep learning is that the model is too big to compute. Um, surprising to me, but nevertheless it's true. That is to say, to compute in real time. And so the idea that one, sh one should try to shrink these models, you know, on the one hand, it will give you some further insight into them, but it also just makes them smaller, which makes them more usable. OK, and on that, I think I'll, I'll stop and thank you for your attention.